was. Alrighty, so welcome to Creative Differences, everybody. I'm Jonathan Alvin, and I have with me a preeminent game designer of his own right. He plays everything I can think of and many of the games that I don't. So uh, say hello, Scott. Hi, everybody. All right. Please. So today what Scott uh, Crandall and I are doing is we are doing basically World Building 101 as kind of a first of collaborative videos we'll be doing over the next few months. At first, we're going to start off with just basically my, my image on the screen, and then eventually we're going to transition to where we're doing some episodes on his channel and some on mine so that we can both kind of uh, grow this together. Uh, why don't we, um, since we're doing this uh, kind of off the cuff, uh, why don't we uh, give a little bit of background? Um, to, uh, I know we don't want to spend a lot of time on this because we can always do later episodes, but um, first of all, I've uh, been game mastering for 45 plus years. I started playing when the game was before the game was even published. A friend of mine happened to be happened to have his grandfather uh, coincidentally be Dave Arneson, and so I've been playing with one of the guys that designed the game since when it, since it very first incepted. But uh, the short version, as I, I met with uh, Scott Crandall, what was it about seven years ago now, Scott? Six or seven years ago now, when you were at the other store. We were, I well, it feels like seven or eight. I'm leaning towards eight, but maybe not that long. Yeah, well, we were at, at Gameology at their yeah. original location. And then they uh, moved, and we moved with them. And But at, but at that early time, we weren't playing together. We were, as my, as my dad would say, we went to different schools together. <laughs> we, yeah, we, we were, were at the same store, and I'd look across and see him playing Pathfinder or Warhammer, and he'd look over and see me running a role-play game and sometimes we wistfully say we should get together and play some time and we say yeah 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 but it wasn't until we got over to the other store that uh, i started a new campaign and you were t you happen to be time out where you can come out and play so tell us about yourself scott how long have you been playing i've been playing for around 20 to 22 years i started when i was 15 so youngster I swear. <laughs> Started with, um, I don't know whether, like, I just called it second edition D and D, but it might have been called. There was a a D and D or advanced D and D, which is technically not second. It's weird, but I started with second edition and went through. Everything beyond that point, third, which I honestly did not enjoy too much, but travesty that was 4E, but there's still a fan base for it, myself kind of included. The modern setting, 5E, which I do enjoy, and also some other games like, um, Two notable ones are Savage Worlds and Call of Cthulhu. Basically, I'll give anything a try. That's fair. That's fair. So, uh, Scott joined uh, my campaign this time around, at the beginning of this iteration. So, he has been playing for definitely seven years. Maybe maybe coming up on eight, but definitely seven years of, the, of this iteration. And... We have been off and on talking about the process of uh, being a sort of storyteller, world builder, game design, uh, uh, game developer, whatever, all the different terms that could apply. And uh, I've made recommendations and offers of assistance, and Scott's, you know, given his input. And matter of fact, he wrote a, uh, about a thousand word module for me for. Uh, Nikos. So there's a, a piece of piece of his lore is in there embedded forever in a place called Time Rack Cove. Um, but in this case, we are talking about world building on a 
much more basic level. Uh, the, the truth of the matter is that um, role, play game, role play games have to be set someplace, and there has to be some framework upon which the players can build their experience so that they feel like they are characters in a story. Because if not, then you're just mechanically moving, uh, rolling dice and moving mice, and you might as well be playing a board game, right? So what we're talking about doing today is the process of world building. And the first thing, in my estimation, the very first thing we have to come to grips with is what is it we want when we say world building? What is it we're trying to achieve? You know, what is it we want to accomplish? And so I'm going to ask Scott, what, what is it that, that in this case, since we're talking about specific real world uh, that you're developing, what is it that you want to accomplish? What is it you want to have at the end? At the end of the day, bro, whatever, I just want to have a place that I can call my own and not be affiliated with any preconceived setting or tied into anything that has like, not necessarily come before. I want to acknowledge what's come before, but I want to have a place that I can go to and be like, this is where I run. Let's play. Okay, so... Let's, let, let, let's kind of break this up into a bunch of different pieces because what you said was a lot. Um, when you say you want, yeah, well, let, me, let me try to parse what you said. You said you want, a, you want a place that is yours, that is separate from everything else, and where you can run, where you can determine everything. Is that, is that a fair assessment? Fair enough for the moment. Okay, well... So the first thing we have to look at is creation in a vacuum is fundamentally useless. And what I mean by that is if you said, I'm going to build a world that's wholly my own. Well, if it's wholly your own, then how would a player from the outside be able to interact with it? For it's example, true. For example, let's say you said I'm creating a planet where all of the species are absolutely unique and have nothing to do with anybody else's worlds. Okay, great. But when a player says, "Well, what kind of races can I? What kind of species can I play? What kind of classes can I play? What kind of attributes are we going to use?" If your world is truly unique. There won't be any of those that'll be similar. There won't be any of those that give a meaningful descriptor for the players to work off of. Does that make sense? Yes. So it has to be tied to something. But okay. So therefore, if it's going to be, if it's going to be a, it, uh, the way I say it is that it, for it to be usable, it has to be. Potable and what I mean by potable is when you talk about potable for water We're saying that it's drinkable. You can you can consume it if I am making a world that is potable that, that is going to be Accessible to players. I have to build into it a mechanism that allows them to actually Recognize and identify with the story so, for example, when I describe, in my case, I, when I describe Nikos, I say it's a world that's about the size of our moon. Well, that, that definite, the definitive of our moon gives us a common ground to talk about because we both know what our moon looks like because we're sharing the moon, right? Yeah, we can all see it. So, so if you say... My world is absolutely unique. It's not like anything else out there. Then there's no way for me as a player to yeah. say, well, I want to play at this or at that because there's no anchor. There's no connection. So we have to build in a connection, to build in a method or a means for that connection. So historically, for example, Dungeons and Dragons leaned very, very, very heavily on Lord of the Rings. 
Yes, and that's and that's honestly what I'm trying to avoid. But you can't. If you want to play a fantasy setting, you have to go off of something a player can recognize. If you say, well, I don't want it to be Tolkien, okay, then what will you make it be? Is it going to be Mists of Avalon? Is it going to be uh, Once and Future King? Is it going to be uh, Dune? What, it, what What is your frame of reference? What are you going to use as your common... Remember, you got to have something potable. What are you going to use that would be connectable to other people? It's ironic that you mentioned Dune, because I was in my head trying to describe something last night to myself. And I kind of realized that I was, in a sense, describing similarly, uh, similar to Arrakis, because I was thinking it's a dry, arid Gavland. There's, like, water is a resource that is more... That is, as rare as gold, there's cactus everywhere. But this was just in my head last night. Okay, but this is this is a okay. So yeah. let's 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 draw a new line here. You're talking about setting. When you're talking about what the environment is, that's setting. That has that doesn't really have to do with world building, because your world building has to be larger than any one given terrain set right fair enough fair enough and if the entire planet was desolate there no would, one would ever there wouldn't be anything living on it if there's no yeah. one living on it then there's no that's a really long that's a short story right you land on a planet there's nothing to eat okay <laughs> well <laughs> we're done you know so you have to you have to think about it from a larger scale. And the reason why I mentioned Dune or, you know, whether you talk about Ericus or you're talking about um, Alpha Seti V from Star Trek or or whatever, if, you, if you're picking a framework, then you're giving the player something to grab a hold of. But until you do that, you have to go whole cloth. So if you're yeah. going to say, my world's not like any other world, then what are you going to give as your reason for people to play? What are they? What are they playing? And if you're going to say what are they playing, now the question becomes what are their options? And if they don't have any options, if they only play one thing, that's fine. But now what choices have they got in playing that one thing? Because the players need to be able to interact and you say, well, there's the only, only, only sentient beings are humans. Okay, great. There's still a million different adventures you could run from Babylon 5 to uh, South Park, you know? So. Mm. I guess I have to lean on Tolkien because I want to make this fantasy. Well, no. Now, see, I got to be careful here because you can actually open it up because there's a lot of different kinds of fantasy. Uh, if you read um, Terry, uh, oh gosh, why my brain, my brain just Terry, sort Brooks, of Terry Brooks. Terry Brook. He has dwarves. No. He he has dwarves and elves, but they're both a druid of humanity. It's sort of Shannara aspect. The Shannara universe goes into uh, dwarves okay, being so he's, minors, he... and they're human beings that live inside the mountains. And the elves being humans that uh, that that left Earth and came back, so it's still humanity, but it still therefore gives them the names elves and dwarves. And using those, that's one way to do it. Another way to do it is say, well, I'm not going to use either one of them. I'm going to use Hans Christian Andersen and uh, Brothers Grimm, and it's going to be Old World. Well, if it's Old World, then that's still got those things in there, but they're very different. A dwarf, a dwarf by, you know, old, 
old English or old uh, Germanic histories. It was more of a mischievous spirit and capricious and mean and not at all associated with mining. Yeah, I, I always, like, I don't know too much about, like, I know Grimm, but when you get into Hans Christian Andersen, I don't know too much about it. Okay, so old. Grim, Grim are the older, grittier stories like uh, yeah. Red Riding Hood and um, Hans Christian Andersen. Three Little Pigs and all that. Right. Hans Christian Andersen are the bigger stories you know, Cinderella, uh, uh, Snow White, that kind of story. Beauty and oh, the Beast. Oh, okay. The, the, original, the original Beauty and the Beast. Those, I believe, I'm not, don't quote me on those, I might be wrong, but I think that's where Hans Christian Andersen has his handle is on the, the lore legacy stories rather than the snippety short uh, words of warning kind of stories. I might be wrong there, but I'll have to go back and look now that you made me mention that. Now that you made me think about it, I, I may be wrong there. But my point is that if you're going to have a story lore anchor, you've got to be able to continuity wise explain what that is for a player to understand what you what you really mean you've played nikos a bit so you know the difference between for example a grim and a grunt you you know that the dwarves are separate and distinct from each other and yet they are still genetically the same species right yeah right so if i said you're gonna if, if i said your choices were Eldrin or Grunt Grimm or, you know, uh, uh, midges or mannequins or whatever, you would know those terms because I've given them in reference to other terms you are familiar with. So Eldrin are fundamentally the elves. They're definitely Nicosian. They don't, they don't fit the exact description, but the idea of, you know, pointed ears over five feet tall, similar to humans and their ideologies. So if you're going to if you're going to go to world building and you say, I'm doing everything brand new, you still have to have some anchor. So until you know what that anchor is, it's best to go with something that other players can put their teeth into. So if you just say, well, I've got elves and dwarves, and you don't say anything else, they're going to assume it to be the elves and dwarves that would be, you know, standard role playing fair, which is standard Lord of the Rings watered down. So when you say, again, when you say it's a completely unique world, uh, are we talking about changes in the, in, in the environment? It's not unique because nothing is unique. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. I, 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 get, I wrestle back and forth with that one. One of my favorite sayings is the cleverest of men hide their sources the best. So I do believe that uniqueness is rare, but I do know, like, for example, in uh, one, one specific example I can think of is the um, uh, John Carter, Warlord of Mars, Edgar Rice Burroughs. Like Princess of Mars. Okay, I've never read those books, but I did see okay. the John Carter. If you saw the John Carter movie, you kind of get an idea. The idea is, yeah. That, number one, the beings are different because they're many of them have four arms and tusks. Yeah, and uh, they're very visceral and argumentative and fight a lot and all of that. Yeah, but, they are. But there are also red men of Mars, which we you don't see too much of, but there's a secondary species of, of red human beings, as well as the few like John Carter who are transplants from Earth. But the concepts that he went into furthermore was, hey, Mars only has a sixth of our atmosphere, so my hero from Earth should be able to jump like a half a mile. That's a you know a physical physics change. So are there going to be any physics changes between the world that is and the world that you're making? 
If there aren't, no big deal. We just write, to write it as we are. If there are, then we have to start defining them. What about Good. what about atmosphere? Do, do, do they breathe the same, or do they have to wear apparatus? And if so, why? And if if so, how do they get the chemical? And if they if so, how how do they uh, prevent themselves from getting killed if somebody into, uh, takes away their their resource? Into hmm. next thing, like I said, gravitics comes into it. Uh, your chemical composition comes into it. Does does fire work like it does here? Is there enough oxygen in the atmosphere to to burn? What about what about the other chemicals? Can you make gunpowder? Um, a lot of questions, which is good. Well, and the, and the thing with those kind of questions is, it's, and if not, why not? If you aren't going to mm-hmm. allow them to have gunpowder, why? What what physically makes it so they can't? Because you know, humanity figured out how to make it out of what chicken poop and uh, damn it, what the other chemical was. It was chicken poop and something else. It was real simple. You're talking what the no? I'm thinking gunpowder versus fireworks. I thought the Chinese used Greek oil. When you say that, what is it? We're, we don't even know what Greek. We don't even know what Greek fire was. Today we don't know. We, Wait, we we, we still it. don't know what that was. Yeah. Okay. We don't even know what it was. We we have guesses. We think it must have been like a napalm. Yeah, yeah. I thought I thought it was definitively. I thought I heard somewhere that it was in fact a napalm. No, because when, uh, when they talk about the creation of it in the in the old times, they don't talk about the same same basic equipment that you could use because it was considered a mystery. It wasn't something that just everybody could make. And yet, as I said, when they figured out you could make TNT, you know, you, you could make gunpowder out of chicken poop. And I, I can't remember sulfur, I think, or whatever it is. It's just, the combination's relatively easy to mix together and devastatingly effective when used under control. But the question, though, again, the question is only why. You know, if you, if you're going to say it's a fantasy world, why, like for example, people ask me over and over again, why doesn't Nikos have guns? And I said it has had guns, off and on. But then they ask, why doesn't he have, he have guns now? Yeah, it's only because somebody didn't discover it. Somebody didn't decide to build it. Player characters are the ones that do all of the innovations anyway. So you have to think about that. Think about what it is. So the, the first question is, what do you want? You want something that's totally unique. Why do you want it to be unique? What, what, what's important about it being unique, Scott? Unique is the wrong word, again. Okay. I keep you. What, what, what term do you prefer? Fresh? Once again, French is fuel like the wrong word. Something that I I did want something I can explain and people not go, but you mean drought. Like I guess the main reason why I don't I wanted it to be unique was it can't be because people are always gonna fall back on token tokenism or whatever they know because that's just human nature we don't we want to fall back on what's familiar and that's why the the um standard has become the standard and now i'm snowboxing no 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 yeah yeah no i'm just i'm just clarifying when, when, because if we can't, if we don't get a handle on what it is you want to create, it's awful hard to create. Because when you say, I'm going to create something new, but you don't give a framework for what that newness is, you can't really build it. You know, it, 
becomes frustratingly amorphous. So if what you're saying is, I want to, I want to setting to call my own, poof, guess what, Scott? Right here, right now, I'm giving it to you. You have your own unique one. Boom. Congratulations. That's, that's how easy it is. You got it. Now, how do we make it so that it's palatable to a player? Because you got to get people to come and play in it to be for it to be useful. New world. Yeah, and that is ultimately what I struggle with, because I find myself being guilty of the very thing I seem to be fighting against and falling back on old tropes, because that's all I've known for the past thirty-seven years. Well. 24. You know what I mean. What, what's wrong with that? There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. I just, like... Sorry to leave you hanging, but the reality is that if you if you don't know what it is you want... It's awfully hard to go get it. I want, I know I want a Jupiter-sized planet. Okay, why do you want a Jupiter-sized planet? Have you visited every place there is to visit on Earth? No, I have not. And I honestly know that I have that Earth so, is a very big place. So a Jupiter-sized planet gives you what benefit? The only benefit I can see in the like, short term is, like you said, physics change and may <laughs> Jupiter would probably have higher gravity because of its mass. Much, much higher. Remember, it's more than just alone in diameter. It's, it's 100 Earths, right? So, I mean, just in circumference. I actually did not know that. Okay. It's hundreds, hundreds of Earths. And not only that, since its core is under the immense pressure of that much mass. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> I don't want it to die. Just give me a second. That was horrible. I, yeah, I, don't, I, I tried don't to die it. on camera again. That would not be good. Well, no, if I'm going to die, I suppose that'd be the way to go. Because if you die on camera, everybody gets to see you, and then that film becomes something important to watch, right? I suppose. <laughs> That's disgusting. I shouldn't have thought of that. That's horrible. And I'm not thinking about it anyway. So, no. Um, uh, yeah, if, if it's... <coughs> if, if I it's, just... If, the, if you can fit 100 Earths inside of Jupiter, then the gravity of, of the Jupiter would be more than 100 times the gravity of Earth. And then if you count all the space in between those tiny Earths, there would be even more mass, would even make that number higher. Okay. So, so, the, surface, so the surface pressure on the, on the external surface of Jupiter would probably be at <coughs> about... Um, Gosh, I can't even do the math. It's to be a hundred thousand times Earth. <coughs> so gravity would okay, be Okay, I guess I have to go that's the other thing. I didn't want to go with an Earth like planet because everybody does that. Why do you think we all do it? Because it's the only frame of reference we have. <coughs> yes. Yes. So, how are you going to frame a game that is outside of Earth normals to make it understandable by your reader or your player? I, <coughs> dang, I can't answer that right now. Okay, so well, let's, let's back up. There's a guy who wrote a book, and I can't think of his name, but he was writing about the possibility of a three-dimensional object intersecting with a two-dimensional world from the standpoint of the two-dimensional beings. That sounds... Okay, even that boggles <laughs> my brain. 
Yeah, I'm so sure. Gonna... I'm. I'm sure if I read the book, I might understand it. But well, just I... visually, visually think of it this way: you're looking down at a piece of paper, right? And on the paper, there are markings, and the markings are integral to each other, but they only recognize uh, their length and their width. They don't perceive of you looking down at them because they are on the plane and you are above the plane. Isn't that like a map ever? Like every map ever, except now imagine that's just the paper. The thickness of the ink is, is not even re re registering. So the boundaries make the items things, if you will. And then you go and you try to inter inter uh, introduce, say, a needle, a pin through that surface. You poke right through it. Possibly. Well, not only would you poke right through it, but you would create a permanent circular space that would be undescribable to those that live there. They wouldn't understand what they were looking at. Because they have no frame of reference. It's just think. <coughs> right. So in like fashion, you know, we when we interact with things from other dimensions or whatever, we wouldn't be able to identify it. And if we can't identify it and we can't describe it, how the hell can we ever interact with other people about it? Okay, so that's why we always go with an Earth-like planet. And I don't know why, like, I guess what it comes down to is certain things that annoy me. Right. I guess I'm, I feel like an idiot because I can't explain why they annoy me. They just do because they have become the standard. Why do you box so bad about the standard? I <laughs> guess because I'm wondering, like... I want to be the guy that made the standard. Right? Where's my creativity? I can't be creative if I have to operate within a standard, right? It's I'm getting down it maybe as simple as that. I feel like everything that I try to do is <coughs> derivative of something else. And then that causes me to buck. Except that derivative to derive is to measure something and put it in another context, right? So a derivation, a mathematical derivation, is to measure the area under the angle, right? The surface of the triangle, the, surface, the, the area of the triangle under the slope. You're, I think you're getting into geometry, and I'm going to get past the algebra, too. That's fair. Well, you know that... Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's actually calculus is what I'm talking about. I, know, I can't understand it either, but the idea is this. you got a sloping line, and then if you're going to measure this object point, and you say, what is the derivation of this? The derivation of this is equal to its x value times its y value times one half. One half of the base times height, because it's a triangle. And that's to get you the area, which gives you a derivation. Meta that's in the mathematics and the metaphoric of it a derivation is taking something and making a new theme along the side of it so that it is recognizable you derive something so that you still get the buzz like for example one of the best adventures i ever ran i actually did took the movie 13th warrior and put it into game terms but they never told the players that's what we were doing so i made the players um, learn a language by listening and as a player, whenever I get one movie, because you do do a lot of movies, that's what you do. Right. And as a player, when I recognize the movie, that's one of the things that makes me groan because I know where we're supposed to go and... Or I have an idea where we're supposed to go and in some small way that takes me as a player out of the game, not fully, but a little bit. 
But then again, I don't always recognize the movie, like, you twist it just enough that it's like, okay, it's not exactly the same. And maybe that's well, what we're doing. Well, remember Dorothy's response to the wizard when she finally sees him standing behind the curtain. You remember what she told him? What she said to what she called him? I can't because it's been a bit since I've seen. She calls yeah. him a charlatan. She goes, yeah. you're, you're a faker. You claim to be a wizard. You're not even a wizard. You, you're just a guy with a camera. But her entire life was dependent upon the idea, the concept of who the wizard was. And eventually he does get her home. So does not, that not make him a wizard? So your yes. frustration, when you see the shadow behind the curtain, you say it bugs you. But it shouldn't. It should show you how clever you are that you got to that point because now you can play the same story that I'm playing. Exactly. Because we know that we still want it to resolve. We still want it to resolve positively. And if you have an idea of where it should go, you can take it how you want, the direction you want to go in, but you know where the destination is going to be. Yeah, and... I guess what it comes down to is, it bugs me, and I cannot explain why it bugs me, and maybe that's what we need to know. Well, that's getting into metaphysical of my brain, and I guess that's part of this. I got a secret for you. This is all metaphysical. Role-play games are metaphysical. Okay, so we've dispelled that we need, at least for our starting point, an Earth-like planet, because that is our only... It's our frame of reference. It's our reader's frame of reference. Yes, there are, move there are books that I have read that try to go from a completely abstract position, but almost all of them internalize at some point. Like, for example, in the movie, um, Everything Everywhere All at Once. There's a scene where the the woman and her daughter are both rocks. That makes no sense. Because even if they were related in the ancient past, they would not be both rocks. They, 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 rocks are not sentient. But, but for the story, it made sense. But it only made sense because they anthropomorphize the rocks by putting eyeballs on them, googly eyes on them. <laughs> Okay, I have not seen that movie, but it's very good. Oh my god, yes, that's a that's amazing scene. But my point, my point being, we still have to anthropomorphize everything. We have to be able to make it into the framework we can understand in order for that story to have meaning. So, ironically, the very thing that you feel frustrated about is the thing that makes the makes your game more appealing because the more you stroke those, uh, what are you going to call them, the tropes, the more you tap them on the shoulder and say, oh, remember this? Oh, the, what is it, member berries? Remember this? Remember that? Doesn't this feel kind of like this? You know, you, you, the more you get that from the player, especially if you can do it sweetly and without them not without them realizing where you drew it from, it's classic. It's, it, it, it's perfect because... We all want to be, if you, if you watch the Lord of the Rings movie, we all want to be Orlando Bloom at some point and slide down the trunk of an elephant like a surfboard. I mean, that's, that's, that's too cool for school. There's no way that should really happen. It didn't happen in the book, but that was kind of a cool vivid visual. So we all go, that's kind of a cool thing. Let's be fair. A lot of what Legolas did in the movies didn't happen in the books. Was but, like a, many of the scenes weren't even Legolas's. They were get, they were Glorfindel or somebody else. Yeah, I know. But my 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 point being the the more you're able to feed into the player the story you want them to hear in such a way that they think it's something original. That's what you're really going for. Which means you have to be quick on your mind. You have to be quick on your feet, so that. Uh, you don't reveal too much or you 
draw too closely on the uh, objective you're drawing from. But the world building aspect of it, though, really goes back to you've got to have familiarity. You've got to have things that are alike. Okay. Like the very thing you want, you're balking at. The very thing you're saying, I want to be different. No, you don't. Because if you are different enough, you'll have no viewers. Because no one will know what the age you're talking about. So if you say, I don't want to have, like, for example, Nikos, there aren't any humans at the beginning of the story. What are you talking about? Of course there are humans. There are always humans. Nope, not any humans. There has to be humans. Mm -mm, no. And that is something I buck at. But that's less because my mechanical mind is being like, humans are boring. Why? What makes us boring? The, the I'll, 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 I'll throw out some names, and I think you'll see what I mean about that not being true. Humans not boring. Uh, Alan Rickman. Fair enough. Gary, uh, okay, you know, Gary I, Oldman. I yes, exactly. Go down the list. You know, there there are. I know there are a hundred actors, a hundred people in dramas, characters in dramas. Uh, the gentleman from. Uh, Mr. Strange and Dr. Neural. That was, I mean, I'd say that it's a stretch because he, Drew, he was played by a human, but he is more fey, more mystical. And but he still, but, had, still had two arms, two legs, two eyes. He was still a human in, in terms of storytelling. Now, granted, there was a rich, rich, rich background for him. But that did not take away from the fact that the story still had a human interchange. And I'm only talking about how the fact that characters can be as bizarre. Ahab, played by Patrick Stewart in Moby Dick. I do not remember. Patrick Stewart playing Captain Ahab. Yeah, there is. I it, remember. It was a, a relatively modern version. Wait, are you talking? You're not talking about in the heart of the sea. No. Well, no. Yeah, that, that, yeah, that is. That's Mo, isn't that the Moby Dick story? I thought. It, it, yes. Yes. But I don't remember him in that. Uh, I remember I, Hemsworth, but. Okay, well, uh, you, you, you know what I'm saying is uh, him and yeah. I, Claudius. Him and I, Claudius. Fair enough. You, you, you can name any... You say a human being is boring. A human being is only boring if the person who is in this... The only, whether the light, if the light bulb is off. If the light bulb is on at all, the person is interesting. Deadpool. Granted, he's not a human being. He's super, a superhuman, but... It's still Brian Reynolds' interpretation. That, although some people would consider Brian Reynolds boring. I who? am... Who? Who? I'm going to punch him in the face. I'm going to punch him square <laughs> in the face. Ryan Williams. No. He does tend to play the same... He doesn't. Of... He doesn't. I mean, he, he uses the same canny approach to speaking, like in Deadpool and Free Guy, but he's not the same. Free Guy is not, definitely not Deadpool. No, no. I'm, I'm, they are two completely different movies, and... Now, Kevin Costner, you could probably say that for about eight of his movies are identical, but... You see... But you watch a movie like Criminal, and all of a sudden he can act too. You probably didn't see Criminal yet. No, I haven't. But now I'm wanting to go back on Kevin Costner movies and be like, eh. but there's enough humans that can act. You made your point. 
Well, there have to be because any of the roles you see that are interesting for other people had to have been manifested by other people. Dwarves are interesting because of uh, John Rhys Davies. Not John Rhys Davies. I, I mean, Gimli is the iconic dwarf, but really, um, other, other okay. The only other one I can name is the one from Hawk the Slayer. Can you can you name any other? That's that's bald into the Iron Hills. Can you think of any other dwarves? By name? By character? Well, Dame the Second was pretty good. Billy Con was as bad as the Hobbit movies are, Billy Con was betrayal of Dane, I found hysterical. Fair. That's this, fair. This, that's fair, and I give you give you props for naming one. I can't I couldn't have th- I couldn't have thought of any others. Because to me, all the Hobbit, all, all the dwarves, uh, blurred together in the Hobbit because the movie was so bad. But I'm just trying yeah. to say, other than Tolkien, can you think of any other dwarves at all? Okay, Peter Dinklage. He is a dwarf actor. Does he ever play a dwarf race? No. He is a uh, yes, he, yes, he has. When? I thought he played one of the dwarves in, um, let's see, which Chronicles of Narnia was he in? I could have sworn he was in Prince Caspian. Okay, eminently, eminently forgettable only because the role was so small. So I don't, I can't think of him, so that's fair. But I'm saying, generally speaking, well, and even that, even then, you're specifically calling on C.S. Lewis. Where do you think he came up with the concept of what dwarves were in his world? Tolkien, because Tolkien <laughs> was the guy who said, this is what a dwarf should be. Right. However, he definitely, he definitely wasn't drawing against the Gaelic idea of the little people. You know, Darby anyway. O'Gill and the little people definitely is a different aspect, right? Yeah, but I see those more as... You're talking about the movie with Sean Connery, right? Darby O'Gill and the Little People, yeah. Yeah, those are more... They are dwarves, but they're more leprechaunish to my... They're literally the little people. Yeah. As a matter of fact, before Tolkien, all fairy people were little bitty. Tolkien's the one that made them taller than humans. Or as tall as humans. Before that, the fair folk were always little bitty. Elves and brownies and pixies and fairies were all the same size. Yeah. But my 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 only point that I was trying to make is that other than other than humans, you say you know humans are boring. Other than other species that have been played by humans, we don't have any frame of reference for anybody else. Well, because they're because humans the only, are... Because we're the only sentient race we know. Yes. <laughs> so we're boring only because we're the only ones we know. We're also only, we're only exciting because we're the only ones we know. <laughs> Well, when I said that, I was look. Sorry, I I cannot help but look at my game mechanics when I say something like that. Okay, well, well that's a slightly different topic, but let's that, that's, let's sit on the just a minute because we're we're uh, about done with our first hour here, so we have to start winding down for this first episode. We can start again right after that, but we want to definitely finish out one hour and. Yeah. Over. Um, the game mechanics are made less than boring. Why? What do you need the game mechanics to do? You see, It's just a different flavor, and now I know you're going to get in the playground, but that's next episode. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not going there at all. I'm asking what, 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 what 
game mechanics do? What 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 are they doing for you? What's the engine for? What's the purpose for them? I'm going way simpler than you think. The purpose for them was originally to determine things. But I think what you're getting at is they become no, I, what I, where I was going with it was it's because role-play games to you are an ant farm. You want to put the pieces in the universe and see what happens, but if the rules are applied vanilla to everybody, that's not interesting as far as an experimentation to you. Is that a fair assessment or am I overstepping? No, that does fall in line with one of the GM styles that I feel I have become the, uh, the simulationist. Now, I look at that and say I'm not a simulationist, but then again, I could be. But the problem with, the, with that is... That's another topic altogether, which I don't want to get into. Well, but then, well, I'm just trying to put a put a pin in and, and nail down specifically when you say role play games should have something other than humans because humans are boring, or I don't want to include humans because humans are boring. What that what that really means? Because all if all you're saying is that I need a rule set that lets my whatever my being is have modifiers that make him special then that isn't really about role play that's physics it's world physics you know uh, terry uh terry brooks and shannara says that dwarves are more resolved because they live in the mountain and therefore are more griv gravitically influenced so they are stronger because they are closer to the mountain and therefore draw more energy from the mountain. Be much tied to the earth. Well, that's, yeah, but what I'm getting at is that's a physics situation <clears throat> that he adds. It doesn't have anything to do with the personality of a dwarf. It only has to do with, if you will, the D and D equivalent would be the die rolling portion of the game, not the character role play of the game. Does that make oh, sense? Per, yes, but person now. Sorry, I'm trying to like, I'm trying not to go too long. Oh, we got. We can always like. So if you do another, yeah, another add on episode. But I'm just trying to clarify. That what I'm talking about for world building here is that the need to move numbers, I mean, the need to move off of the framework is overcome by the need to have a framework that the players can recognize. Yes, you need to have a framework that players can recognize and then you can move off of it from... Well, you can, you can definitely do vamps on that, but what I'm what I'm getting at is from a world standpoint, you need to create a framework that is normalized enough that another person who's reading or, or or being involved in your product can feel like they live there. Yes. If they can't, then it's disjointed, disconnected, and they'll never be able to connect, and won't they won't stay. It'll be just a thought experiment. Does that make sense? Yes. I mean, it's 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 just like when we talk about Nikos. When we start talking about Nikos, you look you talk about Musk as if he was in the room, because he is in the room because because Nikos exists between us as a shared experience. Because you know what I mean when I say it. If you're trying to get to your players feel that way about your world, your world has to feel as real. And yeah. You can't. Therefore, it can't be. It can't be disconnected. Does that make sense? Yes, and that's been my biggest struggle. Is everything is 
disjointed and disconnected and chaotic. Well, you said uh, you wanted that, though. That was, what you, that was your premise when you started. I want something that's unique and different. If it's u- unique and different, then it's disconnected. That's not helpful for what you really want. What I'm getting at is that what you say you want and what you really want are, are, are not yet gel. Because what you really want is an identify and recognizable place where my players can interact in such a way that I know that they're in my world. Notice how I change that to me because it makes it easier to explain. If you are trying to create something new and unique that has nothing to do with anything else, you've already succeeded because if you can't get people that want to become part of what it is you're doing, then what you have created is new and unique and different from anything that they can't understand or embrace it. So instead we have to look at what it is you were really looking for and figure out how to pursue that. Does that make sense? Yes. All right. Well, we are out of time. We're we're less than 60 seconds here before our hour is up. So I want to thank uh, Scott Kendall for being my guest today on creative differences. Uh, This has been World Building 101. We'll be doing more episodes uh, in the future. And then we'll also be adding new new shows on uh, Scott's channel when he gets it up and running and continuing this process there as well. So thank you very much for your attendance. And uh, uh, thank you again, Scott, for being a guest. It was fun.